The following program is sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. About Money, a different approach to investing you won't hear anywhere else. Your host, Mike Adams, is a registered investment advisor and works with investment portfolios exceeding over $100,000 in net worth and has a proven track record of managing long-term investments surpassing the markets in the long term. The information shared on the following program is for educational purposes only and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. And now, here's Mike. It's time that we talk about money. Here we go. Lots of things to talk about today. I've got a great guest who's got a great story. You want to hear what she has to say? You know, trying to quit buying our U.S. Treasuries, and they're not the only country that quit to quit buying. Why? Well, we're going to talk about that in the show. We have a new webpage for Adams Financial Concepts that's just gone up. Our other one was hacked. Now we have a new one. I like the new one even better. So check us out, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. This Saturday, I will be at the Boat Show, broadcasting the show live from 2 to 3 p.m. You can catch it on this station and another radio station. I've forgotten already which it was. And I, KLFE, KFLY, KFLY, KLIFE, but we don't say that anymore. Okay, just got the word. Okay, so, and that reminds me, Coming in March, we'll be changing stations because they're going to do something different with this station. So anyway, um, all that's coming up. But I want to start. I want to start by talking about a company called F Squared. F Squared was the largest money manager in the country, in the world. They were managing twenty-eight billion dollars. They started. In 2008, marketing what they called the Alpha Sector Fund, 2008. But even though they started marketing in 2008, they had a track record that went back to 2001. And they were a multi-billion wealth manager. They were marketing this, their fund, the Alpha Sector Fund, to a lot of financial advisors and companies, registered investment advisor companies. But you know, that track record that dated back to 2001, all the way they were marketing through 2011, they had phenomenal results, or comparatively phenomenal results. Not quite like Madoff, but they had really good results. And in 2008, that was already a seven-year track record, and by 2011, it was already a 10-year track record. And it looked very, very good. But it was based on an algorithm, an algorithm that had been developed by a college student. And they claimed it produced positive returns across multiple market cycles. Where the, the market went down, they still got usually positive results. When the market was up, they got positive results. Sounds almost too good to be true, huh? So they claimed that from 2001 to 2008, 100,000 had grown to 238,000. Now, remember, the market began to crash in 2007, and by the end of 2008, it was down 30%. But they showed their fund, had, 100,000 invested in their fund in 2001 had grown to 238,000. You know, that was the alpha sector fund. But in fact, the numbers were not true. Now, 2001 to 2007, you had a pretty good market going on. We had some ups and downs, but we had a pretty good market. If you had invested, actually, you would have gotten a return. It would have gone from 2001 to 2008. When it was recalculated by the regulators, they found it wasn't 238,000. It was 138,000. And they took it 2001, of course, was the bottom of the market back in the dot-com days. So they'd actually taken the bottom of the market to the bottom of the market, and they'd actually produced, over seven years, about a 5% return, which wasn't bad, but they were claiming a very significant return. And not only had they begun to market it in 2008, they continued to market it through 2011, 
And the result of that was they were forced to pay back $35 million to investors. They'd been marketing it to financial advisors, so they were fined a big chunk of money. They marketed it to something like 14 investment firms who accepted the numbers verbatim. They just, if it was printed on the paper, they took it as, as gospel. And Virtus Investment Advisors, for example, they would ended up being fined $13.4 million, having to pay $1.1 million in interest and $2 million in a penalty. 13 other advisory firms paid penalties ranging from 100000 to 500000 and had to disgorge the profits that they were supposed, or the money that investors had put in. From a, a compliance standpoint, it was really interesting, and I picked all this information up at a compliance mm-hmm. conference. It was really unusual because not only did F Squared get fined, but so did the investment advisory groups, the investors. The advisors didn't do due diligence. They didn't check into it. Seeing that kind of a return and market neutral seemed unusual to begin with, but no one asked the question why. They simply didn't check it out, and they trusted F squared. Now, all that to say, all that to say, at a lead-in, I started doing a series last week on what's wrong with financial planning. Last week, I talked about Monte Carlo simulation. That was the forecast of how people were going to do. Put your money here, and this is how you're going to end up. It's going to compute a probability on how much money you'll have if you save X amount, if you save Y amount. It's going to show you how well you're going to do and the, the probability. And that probability was based on the normal curve. That was looking forward. And math is one of those sciences, and I... I'm a mathematician, so that if you can show any time that one thing is wrong, you know, you have to say the entire theory is wrong. You know, I used the example last week of October 19th, 1987, because if that was based and really the market obeyed the mark, the bell-shaped curve, then on October 19th, 1987, the odds of that happening based on the bell-shaped curve were a 20 sigma event. Now, for mathematicians, that means a whole lot. But to tell you what that means, that means the chances of that happening are 1 and follow that 1 by 87 zeros. Now, $1 trillion, $1 trillion? is one followed by 12 zeros. The chances of October 19th, 1987, if the normal curve, that bell-shaped curve really helped, would have been, actually it's two and three quarters, octovision trillion. That's a new number for me. I learned that number recently, just figuring out the odds of that happening. And I didn't figure out the odds. Those were figured out by other people. So that's 257 followed by eight, 87 zeros, 87 zeros. The chances of that happening in your lifetime again must be really, really low unless you live for a long, long, long time. So that was a a reason, one of the things that's wrong with financial planning looking forward, you know, and it had an impact. It had an impact because 2007, 2009, there were a lot of retirees that had less money than they planned. They either had to go back to work they had to work more, or they had to reduce their spending. I know families whose children were set to go to a fairly good school, and their college funds had shrunk so much that they had to choose schools that they didn't want to go to. That, that had a significant impact, and all those people had those retirement plans. You know, that was looking forward. But using the information from F squared, I want to look backwards because F squared claimed using their data that they used data from 2001 to 2008. Not only was it based on an algorithm, but it was back tested data. 
It wasn't true. They had not invested a single dollar in that algorithm. They hadn't had anyone invest in that algorithm. It was all a calculation. I've seen any number of algorithms, any number of times in which back-tested data, looking backwards, and when you look forward, it doesn't work. You know, the market is dynamic. It changes. And when you see on a number of things where quant models are used, quantitative models, where they build an algorithm, an algorithm which where the, the computer forecast forward going forward based on information gained from looking backward. But that's what financial planning does as well. It's not called black back testing data. It's called taking the average data. There's a big difference. And we're coming to a commercial break. So what is it about financial planning looking backwards that's wrong with financial planning? We're going to come to that. As I said at the beginning of the program, we have a new website that launched, Adams Financial Concepts. Have a look at that and tell me if you like that. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. About Money on Twitter. About Money on Facebook. And we're coming to a commercial break. Don't, don't go away. Got a great guest today as well. We'll be back very shortly. About Money with Mike Adams will resume in a moment on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Did you know the 20-year annualized S&P return was 8.19%, while the 20-year annualized return for the average equity mutual fund investor was just 4.67%? That's a gap of 3.52%. It doesn't sound like much now, but it could mean the difference between retiring in comfort and running out of money. For some seniors, a gap that large could cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars and cut their retirement short. Don't run out of money. Call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts today, 206-903-1019, and learn more about how you can, one, create wealth for retirement, and two, protect yourself from running out of money. Adams Financial Concepts specializes in creating and maintaining wealth. Call today, 206-903-1019, or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. back with more about money for details on what you hear on today's show visit adamsfinancialconcepts.com now here again is mike adams so i've been talking about financial planning and what's wrong with financial planning there's a phrase called geico or word called geico is garbage in garbage out you know when the gar when you put in bad numbers you're going to get bad numbers out the other side and I believe that history doesn't repeat, but that it rhymes. And you can learn a lot of themes from the past, and some will apply going forward. Not exactly, but you get themes, you get patterns, you get ideas going forward. I believe that you can learn from the past, but it's not specific. I used F squared as an example because they build an algorithm. From 2001 to 2008, it said if you'd invested 100,000, you'd get 238,000. In fact, if you'd applied the real data, you would have gotten not 238000 you got 138000 They oversold. But I believe that financial planning uses some of that same kind of concept. You plug in the returns you expect for the stock market and the return, the average stock market return from 1928 to 2014 was about 10%. Or... It was 8% if you just look at the last 30 years. Or if you listen to Warren Buffett, it was 7%. It depends upon the assumptions moving forward. If you're accurate in your assumptions, you're going to come out well. But how often are you going to be accurate forecasting stock market returns for the next 10 years or next 20 or next 30 or next 40 years? And that's the timeline you're looking at in a financial plan. You know? You can look at 
the returns from August of 1982 to March of 2000. That was the last secular bull market we went through. We had a 12.9% annual return in the Standard & Poor's 500, 129 A lot higher than the 10%, but it was for a period of 18 years. On the other hand, if you look at March of 2000 to March of 2009, you have a minus 6.9%. So how do you plan? How do you make an example of that? You make a general assumption as to what the stock market's going to do. You make an, another assumption of what the bond market's going to do. You make an assumption for what inflation's going to do. And you base that on a financial plan on historical records. But historical records will vary depending upon where you start and where you end. And when you're looking at that, you're looking at what money you can take out at the end as well. What income? I use an example. It's an extreme example. But I talk about the person that has 100000 that needs a $20,000 annual income, and they're going to take it all at one time at, at the end of the year. And so the first year they put in 100000 the market goes up 20%. They have 120000 at that time. They take their 20000 out. They're still left with 100000 Everything is fine. So they move forward, and the market's up 20% to 120000 They take out the 20000 They have 100000 But the next year, instead of going up, the market goes down 20% from 100 to 80,000. Now when they take out the 20,000, they're left with 60,000. And now to get back to 120,000, the market has to go up 100%. That's an extreme example. But if you do it for a longer period of time, they're finding that even taking 4% out of a portfolio will eventually erode the principal. The reason for that is going to be a third series in financial planning. We'll talk about the third reason why everyone is reducing the amount of money you can take out of a portfolio. There's a reason for that. But the problem is going forward. We're looking at a sim Mar Monte Carlo simulation, which is based on a normal curve, the bell-shaped curve, which is wrong. Looking backwards, we're looking at average returns which depend upon the date you choose for the start and the end and are all over the place from a positive 12.9 to a minus 6.5%. It really gets into a loosey-goosey kind of situation. That's the second thing wrong with financial planning. This is going to be a series. There's a few more things that we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks. Anyway, before we get to China and why is China not buying our bonds, I want to introduce my guest today, Karen Clark Cole of Blink UX. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Mike. Nice to be here. Why don't we start with your background? Sure. Um, I actually have an art background, so I started in art school, painting, printmaking, um, all the creative things you can do. Not the math. Right. Um, but creative problem solving, the other side of math. Um, and then I moved up through the years, that was back in the uh, mid-90s into multimedia before the web was really going, and then gradually made my way into uh, graphic design uh, for websites. So that's sort of how I got into the user experience world. So what do you mean the user experience world? Well, um, what, so what we try to do at Blink is our, our main goal is to make technology human. And the idea there is that through understanding the behaviors and the, the way the actual end users think, what their mental models are, what their needs are, what their context of use is, uh, really understanding them, we can design a system, a product, a digital product, a physical product, to really meet the needs of these users in an intuitive way so that it becomes about the experience that these products and services actually provide and create for the end users and it's not about the technology itself and so if you can get back you know, get busy living and um, enjoy a better experience through the service or the technology that you're using and it can enhance your life because it's so seamless it's so intuitive it's so easy to use then that's a great user experience so we didn't talk about this before but one of the one of the programs we do are 
our performance is calculated by Morningstar. And every time we go through adding an account to Morningstar or adding a report, it takes hours to try to figure it out. You almost have to relearn the entire system from the beginning. Otherwise known as a bad user experience <laughs> and extremely costly. You know, that's one of the major KPIs for user experience is can we reduce support costs uh, for call centers? Can we reduce um, redundancy of time, of activities, relearning things, training within organizations? If you think about it, if you can actually provide a an internal application that employees use day in, day out, all day long, if you can make that intuitive and easy to use and it actually maps to how they need to use it, you can really save a lot of time in efficiency as well as in um, retraining, you know, reading that cheat sheet. How long does that take every single day? Um, so that there's real um, dollars associated with time um, and effort if you can make a system internally that helps people with their productivity and their jobs. And... If it doesn't work well, you tend to avoid using it. Right. And nowadays, people, because most things you're downloading, uh, there's no manuals. Um, if it's not working, people won't use it. They will simply refuse to use it. And so I talk about user experience as being a business requirement now. It used to be a differentiator. If you had a good user experience, if you opened the box and you could plug it in and use it, like in the Apple days, that was a real differentiator. But now it's actually a requirement um, because... People have seen that it's there, it's possible, it can be easy to use, um, and so now they expect it. And so companies actually can't be in business anymore or for very much longer unless they're really designing things with intention for their actual customers. So take me through the process. If someone comes to you, if I were to come to you and I have a company and I have a digital platform that I want to use, what's the process for Blink to deal with that? Sure. The, the first thing we try to do is to understand if there's any problems to be solved. So we, we're really in a strategy phase at that point, and we're understanding um, the client's business. We want to know everything about what's the business model, how you know how will the company be successful, um, and then we go through and understand everything about their actual customers. And so that these are real qualitative interviews. We go one on one out in the field. Uh, we're traveling largely around the world to meet our clients' customers where they are. Um, if, if it's something, uh, let's say it's an in-car um, an in-car um, system that's helping you navigate, we, we would be in the car with them, understanding how they use it, what's their context of use, um, or in the office, in the home, you name it. And then we bring that back to the project team, and so then we work very collaboratively, collaboratively in partnership with their clients. To They, they always know their, their business the best, and then we end up understanding their customers in terms of how they need to use this new system um, as well as we're bringing de facto design standards and we're bringing um, best practices around their industry or the type of tool that they're creating or system. And then we put that all in the mix and uh, we really work in you know great partnership of bringing all the best minds and the best ideas together. And then we get busy designing the system and it's really designing every click, every page, every interaction. Um, what's the experience like when you open the box all the way through to plugging it in and then actually using it day over day so that everything is designed everything is designed right to the very last detail so that there's nothing to guesswork, there's no guesswork. It's really scientifically based design is how we think about it. So when you say open the box, you're talking about a physical box, not a digital box. I am. You know, largely everything's got a digital component nowadays and so there's a physical and there's a digital and they're really integrated and for the, for the customer, the end user, your phone is digital and physical all at the same time. You don't even spend time thinking about which world you're in. It's all integrated. And so really the user experience needs to be like that as well, all the way through to the marketing and the branding of the company as well. Like that's an integrated experience for the people who are using it. They don't differentiate, oh, this is marketing, that's a physical product, this is a digital. They just see it as all as one experience. And so when you talk about this, the digital experience, it's not just website, it's it's applications, it's sure. the whole thing. Yep, it's everything. Right now, we, I mean, we just finished working on a voice-activated Internet of Things digital shower. So it, it it's everything. <laughs> it's the whole wide world nowadays. It's becoming more and more digital and more a time of Internet of Things. That's right. Yep, everything will be connected and hopefully in a way that's actually making people's lives better and making, you know, improving lives and allowing people who have disabilities or who are elderly live in their homes again with voice-activated lights and, um, you know, their entire homes can be smart nowadays. So it's really, there's some great potential. 
We're coming to a commercial break, so don't go away. There's more to talk about. I'll be right back. We'll be right back after this commercial. Don't go away. More about money coming up with Mike Adams on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to AdamsFinancialConcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Now we return to About Money. There's more information waiting for you at AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Here again is your host, Mike Adams. So I'm here with Karen Clark Cole. We're talking from Blink UX. So tell me how you got the name Blink UX. Um, Okay, so you have to realize that when we got going, we were in the height of the dot-com era. So we were early 2000s. My uh, co-founder, business partner, and I, uh, we're having competitions for the name of the day. And so whatever name sort of stuck through the hours became the name of the day and then gradually the name of the week. Um, but we had to come up against things like, you know, Black Panda and Red Rails, like all kinds of crazy names at the time. But the requirement was it had to be, you know, it had to be usable. It had to be easy to say. You had to answer the phone and not feel weird. It's sort of all kinds of criteria like that. Um, but the the idea behind Blink really is that um, particularly at the time when websites were really becoming the main way that people were downloading software and, and using things like online banking where the, the application was the website, um, you had a blink of an eye before you're going to lose somebody. And so it became very critical that the usability of the site as well as the user experience was thought through and well designed or you were going to lose your customers instantly. And so we talk about that. You have a blink of an eye to, to retain your customers as well as lose them. Um, and then there's a sort of a funny, the real kicker was when we realized there's um, an HTML tag, uh, the blink tag, and it actually makes your text flash on the page, which is the biggest <laughs> usability crime you could have. So we thought that was funny as well. So, <laughs> so how about the UX? Yeah, so UX is something that's really evolved for us. When we started, um, the industry was known as information architects, and so we were called Blink IA at the time, Blink Information Architects. And then that term sort of became um, small and outdated uh, as the industry was growing all around us, and interaction design became more the name for what we were doing, and so we became Blink Interactive. And then as times were changing, it, user experience became the name of the industry that we were in and the, the work that we were doing. And our work got broader as well. Um, and so we became um, Blink User Experience or Blink UX. And you also have to realize, along with all these, were opportunities of URLs becoming available, which is the real driver. <laughs> Um, and so, and really now, actually, we're, we're going away from the UX part, and we're really just calling ourselves Blink. And so it's kind of like Cher or Madonna. We've grown up enough that we can just call ourselves <laughs> by our first name. Um, but user experience is almost becoming um, too small nowadays, and it's because it's it's integrated everywhere, and it really is becoming such a requirement. You almost don't need to say it in a lot of cases. And we, we talk more about evidence-driven design as the work that we do, which is all of our design work is based in research and actual scientific um, data. And then we put the really creative, innovative um, design on top of that, and it's it's pretty powerful combination. So, so tell, tell me about the types of companies that would be your target market, that would be your – Sure. Your best. It's um, it's it's places. Well, I mean, nowadays it's it's kind of everything, but it but typically it's um, companies where there's real complexity in the systems that they're creating, whether it's for consumers or or their own employees. Um, you know, we work with all of our local favorites, the Amazons and Microsoft and. Um, Starbucks, Holland America, you know, and Holland America is probably a good example because it's easy to understand. So we work with them on their online booking flow for cruises. And so you literally go to the website and there, there's a very, you know, detailed flow and how to actually book and pay and reserve for a cruise. And there's a lot of moving parts and pieces. And the flow of that is really important, um, partly because it's, a, you know, a traditionally a, an industry where you would call and you would work with a travel agent and now everything has really become online. And so to have 
people comfortable with spending a lot of money um, you know, through their computer, there, there's all kinds of things that have to play into that in, in terms of the user experience. It's not just what's it called, can you find it, and where do you go next. It's also, um, you know, the branding around that and, you know, how do, how do you feel when you're there? Do you feel safe and secure to give them your money? Same thing applies with um, banks, with financial services in the terms of their online booking um, or, sorry, their um, online banking um, and then you have all kinds of financial planning services and tools that are all available online now. And so they, you know, the security is really important. And so part of it is if you can create a really intuitive, seamless user experience, you're going to get more trust from your actual end users, which is part of the game. Um, we also do a lot of work with um, healthcare industry um, and then the scientific industry. We do a lot of work with um, NASA, helping them with you know, big data and helping that become more easy to use for scientists so they can get busy advancing science. So taking all the guesswork out of and the, the repetition of things that a computer can do more easily. And if it's easy to access, well, they can be doing their job sooner. And in healthcare, it's also. Yeah, healthcare. I mean, and certainly it's exciting nowadays with all the Internet of Things coming out. And, um, you know, voice, I think, has a massive amount of potential that we're really excited about and we spend a lot of time in um, in healthcare of helping people with disabilities as well as seniors, as I was mentioning before, um, live more productive lives. And so we really see a tremendous opportunity there, um, both in the software and the hardware. And, and really, in, in terms of an integrated home, like how, what, what's the experience of somebody's home in terms of how they live? Um, and then there's more practical things like um, we worked with Providence to create a, a whole, you know, a, really a following new moms right from the beginning of becoming pregnant right through to when their kids go to college of helping them with a how do you integrate better with your doctors and with your healthcare system so that they know you, they can serve you better? Um, wh what do the moms need? What do they want? How can we help them? And so all kinds of ways, just understanding how a healthcare organization can better serve their customers by understanding what their customers actually want and need, and then translating, translating that into the format that they want, which is in some cases a mobile app, and in other cases, you know, lots of different formats. So it's it's sort of reverse engineering uh, in that sense. And I would imagine the customer experience is crucial in the case of healthcare, mm -hmm. and some of the the other areas. If you don't feel comfortable on the, the computer in the healthcare, you're yeah. probably not going to to be there very long. Right, and even you know accessing records nowadays, the doctors want you to log in and send emails and check your records and look at your um, what your last visit looked like. But if you can't, you know, I'm a perfect example. I, I have no idea what the login is for that, and I can't find it. So I'm not going there. <laughs> you know, it needs to be an easier way. Yeah. Yeah. So how would somebody contact you if they have an issue, if they have a reason to, to think about their digital system? How would they contact you? Well, our website's a great place. We're blinkux.com. So that's, um, that's the easiest way to find us. And we have a um, beautiful location down in the Seattle waterfront area. Our office is, a, we try to think about it as a community space with a town hall and an art gallery, and we host lots of public events. Um, and then we've got an office in San Diego as well as Boston now, so we're spreading around. So you are spreading around. Yeah. So tell us again the website. It's blinkux.com. Blinkux.com. Yeah. Well, thanks for being on the program. Thank you for having very me. Very informative. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. It's a pleasure. So I want to shift and talk about China of all things. Seems kind of strange to move from Blink UX to China. But China quit has quit buying US treasuries. Really? You know, at one time they owned twenty three percent of the treasuries that had been issued by the the US government. And now they're getting rid of their treasuries. So what's going on? What is it China function or is it US function? Is it political? You know, when you think about it, and when you look at the real data, it's not any of that. It's total return. You know, Treasury yields from 1980, when they were 12.4%, to the time of 2008, when yields shrank to under 2%, there was a big bond market, bull market, secular bull market and bonds, continued Actually, through that whole period of time, from 2005 to 2008, bond yields have been under 2% or just above 2%. But 
if you were a money manager in the Eurozone in Europe or a money manager in China or India or Japan, with the U.S. dollar increasing in value compared to other currencies, the returns were not 2% or 1%. You had that kind of interest, but very often you had an increase in the capital gains of those treasuries. So they might rise 15 to 20% per year in price as the dollar increased. If you look at where things are, interest rates are based on credit quality, the maturity of the bond, and inflation. The Treasury is the most traded security in the world. You know, at one time, China held, by 2012, 23% of our bonds, and Japan held almost 7%. 30% of our bonds were held by those two countries. Japan has begun to pull things down, but China has really begun to unload. They now have less than a trillion of our bonds. They had 3.3 trillion, but it just didn't happen. It's been a period of time, even with low inflation, no inflation push to push up rates, we're seeing China sell into the market. They've been a big seller. You know, that's something which is happening because of the dollar. When the dollar increased in price, it meant that the bond prices were increasing. As the dollar has begun to fall in price or fall in value compared to other currencies, the value of the U.S. Treasuries compared to other, other currencies, that's falling as well. If you look at it from a country point of view, from a money manager point of view, what's happening is you have U.S. Treasuries shrinking in value, giving you negative returns. And if you had negative returns, wouldn't you begin to sell off what you had? Sure you would. That's what's happening. It's not a political situation. It's an actual money situation. Coming up to another commercial break. Don't go away. I want to finish off this and talk about something else that's going on in the world. Stay with me. Stay tuned. About Money returns in a moment with Mike Adams here on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. How do you picture retirement? House on the beach, small farm in the country, traveling the world with your spouse. The one thing you don't picture is running out of money. Retirement dreams are shattered all too often by poor investment choices, sending many retirees back to work. If you think the job market is tough now, try entering it after you've retired. Don't run out of money. Start planning now. Call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts today at 206-903-1019 and learn more about how you can create wealth for retirement and probably, most importantly, protect yourself from running out of money. Adams Financial Concepts specializes in creating and maintaining wealth. Call today, 206-903-1019 or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. Okay, so I started talking about China selling our bonds. China is not the only country selling our bonds, and then the other countries are as well. But to understand what's really going on, let's talk about where things are. We have to go back. When, when you have a very strong currency, and right now there's talk about strong and weak currency, the president said that we really need a strong currency. Our treasury secretary said we need a weak currency. There's impacts to that. When an economy is very strong, stronger than other economies, currency tends to increase in value compared to other currencies. When currency is, or when your economy is weaker, it tends to decrease. If you go back 
and look at the the euro. When the euro was issued in 1999, it traded one to one for the dollar. But by 2007, the European economy was doing much better than the U.S. economy, and the the U.S. dollar had shrunk so that it took one and a half U.S. dollars to buy one euro, 1.5 to one by 2007. But as we went through the Great Recession and came out of the Great Recession, the U.S. economy has been doing better than the European economy. And by January of 2015, it took only $1.1, a dollar and 10 cents to buy a euro, one, one euro. So we had gone from 1.5 to 1.1 by January of 2015. And if you look at the dollar compared to a basket of currencies, the same thing was happening. The dollar had taken a dive from 2000 to 2005, or 99 to 2005. But by 2007, 8, the dollar had begun to rise in value against other currencies and stood at 1.1. Now, today we stand at about 1.2 or 1.3 to, to the euro, but that's a very significant change. And when you're buying bonds in your own local currency, you're buying those bonds with the, the currency translation from euros to dollars. If you're buying a bond, 100,000 U.S. bonds, and paying for it with 67,000 euros, you have, when the dollar drops to 1.1, you're getting back 90,000 euros for something you invested 67,000 for. That's the way it's working. When it begins to reverse and go the other way, then you're putting in 100,000 euros and you're getting back 90,000 on your investment or 70 or 60. So that's where we are in bonds. That's, that's why countries are buying and selling our U.S. Treasury bonds. And they trade 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 52 weeks out of the year. It's the most actively traded currency or er, security in the world. There's a high demand for it. It's used in central bank reserves. It's, it's been the currency of foreign exchange. And when it increases in value, it, it's a negative impact on exports and a positive impact in limiting imports. It reduces the trade balance. I actually got that wrong. When the currency is down, it makes our exports cheaper and imports more expensive. It's positive for companies in the U.S. that are exporting products. But in doing so, it increases our trade deficit. When you have a strong currency, it limits the exports, increases the imports, and increases the trade balance, decreases the trade balance. So that's one of the things that the currency does, but it also has an impact on our bonds. That is an impact or a side effect of what's going on today. That's why China's begun to take their profits, and they've decreased their holdings from $3.3 billion to under or 3.3 trillion to under 1 trillion, we're seeing other countries do the same thing. What that means is interest rates are rising. We're seeing inflation rise. We're seeing interest rates rise. Do you know that for the past three years, I've been talking about the way this secular bull market, this long secular bull market, which I expect to reach 100,000 or so, the way I think it will end is on very high inflation. That's the curve we're moving on. Just like we did in the 60s and 70s, we're moving that direction for a number of reasons. Anyway, I want to wrap that up. I want to do an update. Some of the things that I talked about earlier in the year, and we're at the early part of the year, and that's the fact that the president instituted tariffs on washing machines and solar panels. Hasn't begun a trade war yet. You know, we didn't begin a trade war last year but it's still possible. There are currently 23 trade dis disputes that were entered against 29 countries in 2017. 
That's the most since 2001 when we were going through the dot-com bust. There's fights over Korean washing machines, which we just did, Canadian lumber and paper, Spanish olives, Chinese aluminum foil, Vietnamese tool chest, Argentine biodiesel, and Chinese solar panels, which we just did. Usually trade disputes are companies that file the lawsuit. But with our new Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross, he wants the Commerce Secretary to begin to bring a lot of these. We have now 127 trade disputes being investigated by the Commerce Department, which could bring additional tariffs on 127 products. Not only that, one of the major ones is steel and aluminum, which the president has to come up, I believe, by the end of this month or early next next month with a decision as to whether it threatens our national security. That is a very, very big deal. That's a very big deal. Having withdrawn from the TPP and having renegotiating in the process of renegotiating NAFTA, those are trade contracts we have with other countries or would have had with other countries on preventing and trade wars and keeping free trade moving. You know, it raises a concern and it means this portfolio should be structured. In the event that we have a trade war, portfolios need to be restructured now so that if there is a trade war, that it will have a limited effect on portfolios. Actually, portfolios should have been restructured last year for it. But it's not too late. If you have a portfolio, look at where the products are going. Look at the exports. Look at the imports. And make a decision now as to whether you want to keep your holding or change it. I would recommend anything that's exposed should be moved out of. Anyway, that wraps up today. I will be at the boat show on Saturday from 2 until 3. If you're at the boat show, come come say hello. If not, tune in. It'll be on this station and KLFE. So anyway, catch me there. And otherwise, I will be back next Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Have a great weekend and a great week. been listening to about money with mike adams a registered investment advisor if you'd like more information about what you heard today or about mike's investment philosophy and strategy or if you want mike to evaluate your own portfolio click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com that's adamsfinancialconcepts.com the information shared on the preceding program was for educational purposes only and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors Join us again for more About Money with Mike Adams here on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. The preceding program was sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. 1300 KKOL. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. If you miss hearing Phil's gang at noon, you have another chance to catch it at 6 tonight. That's Phil's gang, noon to 1 and 6 to 7, here on Business Radio. The following program sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts.